How can you say anything more than wow when you look at this crowd? To Frank Lee, those of us that run, Frank will never be able to thank you enough for providing this venue and the event, and it tells you how much this community means to him. To Pat McCrory, uh, the fact that Pat would come back time and time and time again. You understand a lot about the man. He cares about this state. It pains him to see the decisions that are being made that are not in your best interest. And you know what? I think he will be the next governor of North Carolina. Yeah. Now, what do you say about Leo Daltrey? Well, first thing is, I like Helen a lot better. But Leo has served with distinction. He's never forgotten where he's from. In Raleigh, he is the voice of reason. He's also the figure that many new members go to to get the education that they need because Leo has done it all. We're grateful, Leo, to you for the way you have represented your district, this county, but more importantly, uh, the state of North Carolina and what you have done. I, I, I think trying to decide how the sheriff's election is going to turn out is sort of anticlimactic, isn't it? And, you know, it should be that way, because I think Steve Bissell has done an unbelievable job for you. And I've got to admit to you, Steve, if my family had been here and I invited them up on stage, at 1.30 this morning I would be up because I would not be in my house, I would be locked out of my house. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. My father, like Steve's, was a minister. He was a Presbyterian minister, but my dad believed he should expose us to every religion. So I know what it's like to hit that hot summer week. My dad took me to a Baptist revival. I'm not gonna ask you how many of you are Baptists, but I will say this, Baptist preachers miss their calling. They should have been meteorologists because they can pick the hottest week of the summer a year in advance. And I remember that Wednesday night that he took me and that preacher had hit his Saturday stride that night. He looked out in the crowd and he said, Ellen, do you want to go to heaven when you die? And she said, yes, sir, preacher. He said, come up on stage. She said, Jim, do you want to go to heaven when you die? He said, yes, sir, preacher. He said, come up on stage. Looked over at Sheriff Bissell and said, do you want to go to heaven? Sheriff Bissell said, no, sir, preacher. He said, you don't want to go to heaven when you die? He said, when I die, sure. I thought you were getting a group up to go today. <laughs> now, we're at a real pivotal point. We're 11 days before an election. We're 11 days before a defining moment, a defining opportunity in North Carolina, but in the United States of America that we all love. And the only thing that stands in the way of which direction we go is how hard we all collectively are willing to work for it. And I see people with st st uh, stickers on that they stuck on you tonight. And some of you have got candidates' t-shirts on. I couldn't afford t-shirts. <laughs> Doesn't matter how you participate, as long as you participate. You know, human nature is when you get close to an election, you know you're going to get a phone call. They're going to ask you to make phone calls or to go door to door or to do something. And human nature is to think about, well, I've got to get my hair done on Wednesday. And I've got this on Thursday and I've got that on Friday and I've got a ball game Friday night. I just couldn't possibly do it right now. There's no time that's going to be a better opportunity for us in this state and for us as a country then this year, November the 2nd, 11 days away, you've seen the majority of the candidates that represent locally the county, 
But I want to stop for a minute, and I want to focus on these judges, as Pat did. They don't have R's or D's. Why? Because the General Assembly saw that Republicans were winning the judicial races, so they took the letters off. But let me tell you, there's a difference between a liberal judge and a conservative judge. Amen. If you want to give us what we need, which is the North Carolina House and the North Carolina Senate in Republicans' hands to do redistricting, if you don't put the court there that they need, that redistricting might not be upheld. It is absolutely essential that you be the conduit for these candidates, for these judicial candidates, that you go out and educate your friends, your neighbors, your relatives. Electing judges is not walking into a ballot box and looking for a name that looks familiar or looking for a name that sounds neat. It's about electing people with the ethical qualities that you would like to have sitting on the bench. We just happen to be blessed with it this year. But let me talk to you about opportunity. We've got an opportunity locally to elect people that believe what you believe. We've got an opportunity in this state for the first time since 1898 to let Republicans run the North Carolina House and the North Carolina Senate. years is long enough for them to get it right and they haven't done it so let's let somebody else try you know what uh, excites me most about Renee Elmers is that when I see that check go beside her name as I watch Fox on the evening of November the 2nd meaning that Bobby Etheridge is no longer in office is all right I don't know at that point in time that Nancy Pelosi is not going to be speaker. Now I've heard some claim that when Renee gets there and I go back, we're not going to do what we said. <laughs> Let me dispel that rumor. Let me tell you. America is in a desperate strait right now. Everything we spend, we charge to our children and our grandchildren. It has to stop. I have children. You have children. You have grandchildren. The insanity has to stop. And it can stop this November the 2nd, if you're willing to work hard enough. I'm going to ask you tonight to do something that probably nobody's asked you to do. I'm going to ask you to wipe your calendar clean for the next 10 days. With the exception of work, I want you to find that spare time that you're not working, and I want you to find a way to in involve yourself in the political process. It may be going and working a polling precinct. It may be going to your fellow workers and asking them to early vote. Early voting is contagious. The problem that we have in this country is not Republican, Democrat, or Independent. The solution is in the power of the American people to change their leadership, and you need to be involved in it. But let me assure you, if we miss this opportunity, not in my lifetime, and looking at the crowd, not in your lifetime, a lot of you, will we see this opportunity? Our children and our grandchildren will inherit from us an opportunity that doesn't come close to the opportunity our parents worked to see we had. Now I'm gonna conclude, but I'd like to take a personal minute to tell you a story. A year and a half ago, I was doing a Memorial Day service in Asheville, North Carolina, dedicating a World War II monument there. And when we got through, I had a crowd around me and I called out of the corner of my eye, a gentleman who walked up and was sort of making his way through the crowd. And I saw him reach on his wrist and he grabbed something off and he reached through the crowd and he put something on my wrist. And he said these words to me, don't let this be in vain. Well, when the crowd sort of subsided and I was headed back to my car, I looked at my wrist 
and I realized that he'd put on my wrist his son's KIA bracelet, Iraq, 2006. I drove home, flew back to Washington, sat down to write these parents a letter. And I'll be truthful with you, I had no idea what to say to them. I walked down the hall to John McCain's office because John was the only member of the Senate that I knew that wore somebody's bracelet. And I explained the story to him. And I said, John, I know you wear a bracelet. And he said, Richard, I wear a bracelet. And he opened his desk drawer and he showed me a box where he had 22 bracelets in that box. Parents that had asked him to take their child's bracelet. And I said, what do I say to this family? And he said, Richard, you can only say one thing. I will wear that bracelet or I will keep that bracelet in a box and it will be buried in my casket with me. I went back to my office that day. I wrote this family a letter. I wear it every day. And two weeks ago, I'm in Jacksonville, North Carolina, and I'm telling this story to a group of charged up supporters and workers. And I got through and the crowd subsided and I started to move to the bus. And this husband and wife came walking over to me and she reached on her wrist and she pulled her son's KIA bracelet off. And she said, Senator, start your box. Now, we think we've got it tough. We think it's hard work to go out and work for candidates, and to go to polls and ask strangers, vote for this person. We think it's tough when we go out and say, I want to educate you about conservative judges. Think of the sacrifices that these families have made. The military in this country is the greatest in the world, and they get greater generation by generation. Why? because it seems like we get further away from what our founding fathers came here to create. It seems like the more the fabric of this country gets torn apart, the more the next generation of youngsters stand up and say, not on my watch will this happen. Let's do what they deserve. Let's make the changes that assure them that they're not gonna have to fix our mistakes that we're going to man up to the fact that we've got to fix our mistakes and it starts with electing the right people. If you will commit to me tonight to work as hard as you possibly can for the next 10 days for candidates of your choice to make sure that leadership is in place to make the right decisions, the tough decisions, then I'll also make you a promise tonight. When I get back to Washington in my second term, I'll do everything in my power to make sure nobody ever apologizes for the United States of America again. Thank you very much.